Welcome to SCSA Church Online. My name is Monica and we're happy you joined us today. Here at SCSA, one of our core values is genuine love for the community. The church is called to be the hands and feet of God, so we have a wide variety of programs that serve our local community with no strings attached. If you have a burning desire to serve, a dream that you can't stop thinking about, a skill you would love to take to the next level, we invite you to visit hopemultiplied.org to find out how you can get involved in serving our local community. And now let's get started with today's message. All right, so welcome back, everyone, um, to the well here at STSA. Um, If you were with us last week, um, I told you that we were doing like a Christmas season special, okay? So like a mini-series, a two-week series on um, what we called the perfect gift, okay? And um, last week, we talked a lot about um, that we have received the perfect gift in Christ, but more than that, we talked about what was the criteria for the perfect gift. So Amy, actually, when she was hosting right now, predicted exactly what I was going to do. Does anyone remember what that criteria was? Any chance that anybody remembers what that criteria was? All right, there's one person in the back, the host herself. What was the first criteria? Okay. So yeah, that was one of the criteria is that it should re- reflect the recipient. Another thing is that it should reflect the giver, right? So we talked about how Jesus Christ is the perfect reflection of God the Father, okay? And that's how, the, that he's the perfect gift because he reflected perfectly the God, God the Father, um, and then the second criteria was the recipient, okay, that he should reflect the recipient. Um, it should show knowledge of the recipient. What does the recipient need? So when Jesus Christ came, he knew that one of our greatest needs, if not our greatest need, was enlightenment. We needed light in our life. There's a lot of darkness around. Death was darkness. Sick was darkness. There's a lot of mutations of darkness. And Christ came as the light of the world to take that darkness out. And finally, we talked about how his promises are true forever because the nature of the gift is timeless, Okay, so that's what makes up the, the, the gift perfect is that um, he is timeless as well. And what I told you last week is that I didn't want any practical application, which I resisted to say that, but that's truly how I felt last week is I just wanted you to go home and meditate on it. Meditate on the fact that Jesus Christ is the perfect gift. What does that mean to you personally in your life? This week, we're going to discuss a little bit more of a practical transition here. Um, we have already received the perfect gift. So what's our response? What, what does our response look like? Has anybody ever seen those blogs or, or like, uh, like the Pinterest things where, where it says like, uh, how do you get a gift for a husband or a mom or whoever that has everything, right? You guys have seen those like blogs and articles and things like that. Like, how do I buy a gift for a spouse who already has everything? Nothing I'm going to buy them is really going to be like that, you know, like what could I possibly give them that, that they don't already have? Imagine how much harder it is for God, like, like. Back your brain around that. Like, we're trying to offer God back a gift, right? Somebody gives you a gift, you have to give a gift back. Like, it's rude not to give a gift back. But what do you give God? What do you give God? God doesn't need anything. Like, by his nature, God doesn't need anything. If you were to ask God, okay, Lord, we can't give you something that you need necessarily, but what is it that you want? What kind of gift would you look down on us and say, that's my child. I'm proud of you. You finally get it. You get the point. I think that if we really wanted to make God proud, if we really wanted to make God proud, he would tell us exactly what St. Paul told us last week. There's a key verse last week from Ephesians, and it said the following, and I love this verse so much. It said, for once you were darkness, not in darkness, for once you were darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. I love this verse so much because it's bold and it's direct. It's bold because it says, you were darkness and now you are light. Like the exact opposite thing happened. Jesus Christ came. He took you from a state of darkness to light. But it also is very direct. It tells us exactly what we need to do. To live as children of light. And that light, with that light, there's fruit that comes about. And then we'll talk about these different analogies that um, seem to kind of mix together. And Jesus himself tells us this. This isn't something new. So again, we're asking God, what is the perfect gift, Lord? What do you want? Very famous passage. He tells us, 
for you are the light of the world. And when you read that, when I read that, we should pause. We should pause because we're, we're reading that Jesus Christ is talking to us, and he's saying, you, my children, are the light of the world. Why should we pause? I'm almost embarrassed to read that out loud. Who do we call the light of the world? Jesus Christ. And now he's looking at us, and he's saying, no, you are the light of the world. I look at that, and I say, Lord, how can we be light of the world, like you're light of the world? Like, I'm embarrassed to even, like, say, like, we're light of the world, but you're the light of the world. Then God looks at us, and he says, you're my children, right? If you're my children, welcome to the family business. This is the family business. Light is the family business. To enlighten is the family business. Jesus continues, and he says, a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it on a bowl. But instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So how do we live as children of light? What brings glory to God? Clearly, we see that the offering, the best thing that we can offer to God, is to be children of light and live in that light. And if we wanted to simply summarize it, based on the verses we've read so far, there's something about fruit, there's something about light, I would summarize it in two steps. Very simple. It's a simple formula. We must abide in the light. Okay, we must abide in the light. And then we have to bring that light to others. We must abide in the light and we must bring that light to others. Very simple. Very simple. Two steps. Easy to remember. Maybe the criteria was hard to remember. This is easy to remember. Abide in the light, bring light to others. We have received the light of the world. So now we abide in the light and we bring light to others. The two are actually inseparable. The two are actually inseparable. Let's think about it logically. First, you can bring light to others if you're not yourself abiding in light. And you can't say I'm abiding in light and it's self-contained. Okay, when we're talking about light like Jesus, like we can't say I have a relationship with God and it's self-contained. But at the same time, I can't say I'm going to bring Christ to others if I'm myself, I'm not abiding in Christ. Silly example, but since Jesus loves to use analogies, let's go with this analogy. If you have a light, Let's say there's, there's light all around us in this room, okay? And there's a switch for the light. Can I turn off that switch and turn it back on and say, you know what? I want the light to shine only on this part of my finger. I want the light to shine only on this part of my finger. Is that possible? Of course not. Like, the light, once you hit the switch, is going to shine everywhere. You can't contain the light once the light is there. Same thing if you have a dark room and you have curtains at home and the sun is out. You can't you know, open up the curtains, and you see the sun, and you tell the sun, no, 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 sun, actually, only this room, only this part of the room, please shine only here. The same thing if I have a lamp. I can't take the lamp out of the power source and say, the lamp is broken, the lamp is defected. Well, no, it's not connected to the power source. These analogies that that Christ uses and that are used throughout Scripture are to teach us that, in this specific example especially, that we have to abide in the light, we have to be connected to that power source in order to bring that light to others. And once we are so filled with light, it's uncontainable. It can't just, it's not like shining only this much. No, no, it's everywhere. It's shining everywhere. Jesus uses another analogy that I love so much from John chapter 15 to illustrate the same point. He says, abide in me. And you see that word again, and we're going to, this is going to be like our key word for today, abide. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in me, unless it abides in the vine, excuse me, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Jesus isn't being mean here. He isn't like being like rude to us when he's saying without me, you can do nothing. He's just telling us the truth. He's telling us the truth. This example, the vine and the branches. If I have a a tree, right? Uh, Let's say, I don't know, it grows on trees, whatever. Some fruit grows on the tree, okay? And I have the tree. And I take the branch and I break the branch off and I leave it next to the tree on the street. Is that branch going to bear fruit? Is it possible for that branch to bear fruit? No, it's not connected to the source. It's not connected to the vine. By the same token, can that branch, can that branch now bear fruit when it's in the vine, but say, I want no one to take of the fruit. The fruit is for me. The branch, I'm the branch. I'm going to eat my own fruit. Is that possible? Does the, like when you go see a fruit on a tree, is the branch eating the fruit? No, like the fruit is meant to be used for the person in front of them. A branch without a vine equals no fruit. And a fruit cannot be self-contained. It's not for you personally to only enjoy. 
And I think that's sometimes the difficult part in, in our relationship with God is we think that, you know what, um, I can act a certain way, but I'll be okay in front of so-and-so and I can bring light to others. It's not possible. And the same thing, uh, at the same time, we, we might think that, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and have a relationship with God, but I don't need to talk to anybody else. I don't need to worry about anybody else. No, no, no. It cannot be self-contained. Your life for God cannot be self-contained. We're not meant to live that way. The reality is, is that people are malnourished out there and they need fruit. And you are the branches. That's what Christ says. You are the light of the world. And it's our job to produce fruit so we feed people outside. So we take darkness out of people's lives. And Jesus tells us that this is the ultimate way that we glorify him. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit so you will be my disciples. What offering can you give to a God who has everything? You can bring him his children back to him. One, you can bring yourself to him and abide in him, but you can bring others to him. God has everything. He has no need of anything. But what he desires, what he loves to have, is his children. And we talked today a little bit about family, having a family. The purpose of our spiritual life, the purpose of everything we do, is this today. Is the purpose of Christmas, Christ came to, to, to give us the light of the world so that we may become light in him and become light for others. I want to tackle that, that two-part formula that we talked about. And again, it, we have to what? Abide in the light and bring that light to others. Okay, so say it with me. Abide in the light, abide in the light, and bring light to others. So I want to focus on the first part. Abide in the light, abide in the light. The word abide. What, what does it mean? I was curious because I, I, I love that word so much, and I think it reveals a lot to us about the heart of Christ and what he wants from us. Um, we think of the vine and the branches analogy, and rightfully so, and we think to stick to, to stick to him, to like stick to Christ, to remain with Christ. And I think that's right. But I think there's another layer, another step. If I wanted a definition for abiding in God, abiding in God is to remain in his presence with endurance. And I added that, that last part there, with endurance. If you wanted a purpose for 2021, I think it's this. Okay, Happy New Year, everybody. This is, this is the purpose. Abiding in God is to remain in his presence with endurance. Sometimes we think when Jesus tells us to abide in him, it's like a passive. It's to like just sit with God and passive and do nothing. That's not at all, actually, the way the word is used in, in the Bible. And we're actually going to look at the uh, biblical usage of the word in other passages um, to kind of show us that that's not the case. Um, there's, the word abide, um, the Greek word for it is, is meno, meno. Um, and that word doesn't mean to just remain. It means to dwell, to, to kind of settle in, to take place, to remain for sure, but with endurance. One place specifically um, where we see that actually used is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, and it's a story that I absolutely love. Um, and it's, it's, it's one of those images that we get of Christ in one of his most difficult times here on earth. Okay, so we're going to read that uh, passage together. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and James and John, the two sons of Zebedee. And he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. So the state that Jesus is in right now is he is sorrowful and deeply distressed. And he has his inner circle, so to speak, Peter, James, and John with him. And it continues. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Let's pause before we continue with the passage. The author already mentioned to us that Jesus was what? Sorrowful and deeply distressed. And then Jesus himself says, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. Imagine Jesus right here with us today. Imagine Jesus, like Jesus Christ walks through those doors, sits right here. And he says, my soul is deeply distressed. I am exceedingly sorrowful. What would be our response? What would be your response? Like, Jesus is the king of peace. Jesus is like the, the, like, he's the joy of the world. We would say, Lord, like, why are you sorrowful? Like, what can we do? What can we do, Lord, to make sure that you are not sorrowful? Please, Lord, don't be sorrowful. Like, whatever I did, I'm sorry. Like, please, like, Jesus, like, please, I'm so sorry. Like, don't be sorrowful. And Jesus says, okay, here's my command. Are you ready? Here's my command. Here's what I want for you. Here's what, in my current state, this is what I want from you. Stay here and watch with me. 
The word stay is actually that same Greek word, abide, or minnow, okay? Um, and what Jesus is telling them is he's saying, hey, sit here, remain with me, abide with me. And what's interesting about this command is we're about to uh, see in just a little while, um, is that the disciples and the closest disciples fail miserably at this command. He tells them to stay and watch, and they don't do a very good job. Oh, sorry. So Jesus says, stay here and watch with me. And then he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. Okay? So Jesus, exceedingly sorrowful, he finds them sleeping. And said to Peter, what? It's like, come on, man. Like, it's like Jesus is surprised. Could you not watch with me one hour? Just one hour. Could you not watch with me just one hour? I'm exceedingly sorrowful. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? This is a very interesting passage to me on multiple accounts. A, we see Jesus being exceedingly sorrowful. To me, that's a strange thing to see. It's a strange thing to witness. But more than that, Jesus commands them to stay here and watch. But it's not really for his sake. If you notice what he said, what did he tell Peter? He said, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation, Peter. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he does this three times. He does this three times. I want to ask Jesus, like, what are you doing? Like, they're sleeping. They failed the test the first time. Why the second? Why the third? What's the point here? I think what Jesus was trying to teach them was the importance of abiding in him, of remaining with him, and that it takes work. It takes endurance. There's training involved. And that's why there's that back and forth. And Again, we would look at them and say, Lord, like they're tired. Like is sleep deprivation like really necessary right at this moment? Like they're exhausted. And he says, I'm showing them that abiding in me, although it takes a lot of work, it's necessary for them to be children of light and to overcome darkness. This is the only way. Jesus knew that they were moments away from seeing some real dark times. And he's trying to teach them what it means to stay with him, stay close to him, abide with him, remain with him. Jesus was moments away again from being betrayed and executed, and they would be, the disciples would be lonely, they'd be depressed, they'd be angry, they'd feel betrayed. They'd feel, bet we sometimes think about Judas betraying Christ, but he also betrayed the disciples. Like this was a close circle of, of, of people. And they would feel hopeless. They would see some real darkness. And what Christ is trying to teach them is if you stick with me, you can overcome. If you stick with me, you can overcome. And we clearly see that they understood that after the resurrection. After the resurrection, they endured a lot of, a lot of, a lot of hate, a lot of beatings, stoning. Uh, some were executed. But they stuck with him because they knew nothing could overcome darkness. Excuse me, nothing could overcome the light. And I think that's what Christ is telling us today. I was thinking about, like, what message for 2021 are we, like, in most need of in, in, in our current season of life as, as a nation, as a people, as all of us, like, as Christian children of God? What are we in most need of? And I think this is it. Sometimes I think we would rather focus on the darkness than on the light because we refuse to abide in the light, to remain with God. Why? Because it takes work. Remaining with God, sticking to God takes work. Sometimes, like the disciples here, I'm tired. I don't want to spend time with God. I don't want to remain in God's presence. Sometimes, if we're being honest, we don't want to remain in the light too long because we know the longer I stay in the presence of Christ, there's more darkness exposed, not just out there, but in here, if we're being honest. And I know that when I'm truly in the light I, I, and I'm confronted with those things, then God is calling me to fix those things in my life. And we're afraid. We're afraid of having those things exposed in our life. And I think what Jesus is telling us is, you're misunderstanding. My point isn't to expose darkness to make you feel bad. 
My po- the point here is that you remain in me and I cast out all darkness. That's my job. This won't be easy. It'll take time. It'll take effort. It'll take patience. But don't hide from the light. Remain in the light. Abide in the light. Sometimes we don't want to abide in the light, maybe because there are circumstances outside of our control outside, and we want to take things into our own hands. We want to do things and to solve problems our way rather than God's way. We know what God's way is, but it's easier for us to do things logically based on what makes sense to us. And again, Jesus tells us, remain in me, abide in me. I'll take care of the darkness. Don't worry about it. You may think your way is better, but it never is. Anytime we struggle to remain in, the, in God's presence with endurance, we're reminded of this story of the disciples. And it gives us hope because we see the disciples, we see Jesus in his time of most need, and we see the disciples completely failing. But these are the same disciples that would go on to preach the gospel to the world. These are the same disciples that after the resurrection, nothing can get in their way. Nothing can stop them. And we learn from them that they, they learn the key lesson of in order for them to bring the gospel, to bring the good news, to, to do any sort of good act in the name of God to glorify the Father, they themselves had to be connected to the power source. They had to be connected to that light. I hope that, that like one of the lessons we learned from today is that our, our attitude, especially for 2021, is I must have a little bit more endurance. I must have a little bit more endurance to do whatever I have to do to abide in God, to remain in his presence. Because it's the only way to overcome darkness. So the first step to offer to God a a gift that is worthy of him is that the gift that is worthy of him and and so-called like a perfect gift, as as perfect as it can get, is that we must abide in in his light so we can bring that light to others. So we took a a quick look about that, again, that word abide to remain in his presence with endurance in the life of the disciples right here. What I want to take a look at now is uh, the second part. So we abide in, in God's light, okay, in the light. We abide in the light and we bring that light to others. What examples do we see in scripture where the light is coming to others? Um, and, and there's so many examples, but I chose one of my favorite, favorite, favorite passages in all of scripture. Um, and this is an example of the true light, Jesus, going to someone else, okay? The story of Zacchaeus. Um, it's a story that we're probably all familiar of, uh, familiar with, but it's a story that I love so much, and I think this um, shows us exactly what is, what is called for us to do as well. Jesus enters Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. It's an interesting uh, uh, way to introduce the character in the story. One, they say he's a tax collector and wealthy. And the second thing that is pointed out to us is that he was short, and that's why he couldn't see Jesus. I always wondered about this, like why, like, okay, most people probably didn't like that guy, so maybe like the author is taking kind of like a dig, like a shot at Zacchaeus, I don't know. But what I think here is that they're telling us the state of the man, the state of the man. Where was the man, like what was going on in his mind? The state of the man, he's tax collector and was wealthy, which basically means that he had abandoned God, he had abandoned his people, he was hated by everyone around him. On the surface, Zacchaeus is a hopeless case. He's one of those guys that you see out there that's chasing money, that's chasing whatever, thinking that's going to bring him happiness. But also Zacchaeus knows that there's something else. He knows that there's emptiness inside. He knows that there's darkness inside. And he wants desperately to seek something bigger than what he's currently going through. And I think when the author tells us that he was short and could not see over the crowd— I think for sure, you know, maybe he was referring to his physical stature there. But more than that, I would say he was physically unable to see Jesus, but spiritually unable. Spiritually unable to go ahead and take that, that, those steps to, to see God. But here comes the light of the world. And Zacchaeus knows it. So he ran ahead and climbed on a sycamore tree. He can't see Jesus. But he wants to see him. And then Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must meno, I must stay, I must abide at your house today. Jesus sees the man's heart. And he had so many hurdles, tax collector, wealthy, short, whatever. So many hurdles to see Christ. So Christ came to him. That's what happened today. He had so many hurdles to see Christ. He couldn't get through those hurdles. So Christ came to him. 
And Jesus tells him, I must abide in your house today. And what happens when Jesus abides in anyone's house? So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the, to the Lord, this is later in, in the story, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. If I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. This is an amazing story. Like, all that happened so far was Jesus went up to a guy who was on a tree, said, come down, I'm going to go to your house. And this is the response? How is this? A, like, this response doesn't even make sense. Jesus didn't ask him to do anything. Like, this part of the, like, Jesus didn't say, hey, Zacchaeus, by the way, you've been cheating from people. It's time to pay them back. Hey, Zacchaeus, how about give a little bit of that, that wealth to the poor? None of that was said today. Did his response come out of nowhere? Do we think his response came out of nowhere? I don't think so. The reality is, when anyone is presented with the true light of Christ, they're transformed. When you're in the presence of light, it changes you. And this is a perfect example, and Jesus himself did it. But that's what happened. And to be honest, in today's world, there's a lot of the cases out there. There's a lot of the cases. There's a lot of people that the world, or maybe even the, us as Christians, have written off. Lost cause. Hopeless case. But Christ teaches us <clears throat> that we must not carry on his work. We're in the family business. We're the ones that are called to bring light to others. We must be the ones that seek out the lost, the outcast, the poor. We have to do the same thing. So how we do it is the key. So we talked about how we must abide in the light. We must abide, 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 abide in the light, grow in the light, stay in the light, be so full of light. So then we bring that light to others, and then they abide and abide and abide in the light. And that's what we see today. His response didn't come out of nowhere. Jesus, in his love, in his, in his, he, him being the true light, comes, and darkness is exposed everywhere. He doesn't have to say a word. His presence alone exposes darkness, and it transforms the man's life. The lesson for us isn't to just look at Jesus and say, okay, well, Jesus did that for Zacchaeus. The lesson for us is we have to let others abide in the light of Christ through us. It's easy to look at this example today and to say, you know what? That was what Jesus did with Zacchaeus. But God is calling me and you to be that light in the world. God is calling us to bring others to him the same way that he did, to be there, to be in, in, in the presence of darkness and bring light. What I love so much about a lot of the stories in the gospel, like Zacchaeus, is that people tend to just gravitate towards Christ. Like people came out of the woodworks to see him. Zacchaeus, perfect example, climbed the tree, like basically like made himself look like a fool to see Christ. A woman who's, who has a terrible reputation comes and she cries at the feet of Christ. There's so many other examples. There's so many people that just gravitate towards Christ. And we say, Lord, like why, why are all these people gravitating towards you? The answer, light, light of the world. When, when there's light and, and I have darkness, I gravitate towards the light. I want more light. And when we are people full of light, when we taste that light and we grow in that light and we live in that light, people will gravitate towards us and say, hey, what, what's your secret? What's going on? Like the world is bleak out there. Everybody's negative. Everybody's, why are you always so thankful and encouraging? And like, what's going on? I think if we wanted to truly reflect Christ and we wanted to offer him that perfect gift, this is the formula. It's very simple. It's very simple. It's not complicated. Christianity isn't about complicated formulas. It's very simple. But it's difficult. It's simple, but it's difficult. Because to abide in the light of Christ means that I have to put in some work. I have to put in some effort. I have to grow in the light. I can't just simply say, I'm going to be passive. I'm just going to, you know, go into church one day and hopefully I come back out, you know, uh, completely different. Like it just doesn't work that way. I have to put in some work. I have to have a real relationship with God. I have to spend time with God in prayer. I have to spend time with God in reading the word. I have to gather together as a community. I have to come to church and partake of the sacraments. I have to do all that stuff. But we're not doing that stuff just to do it. We're doing it because that's our calling is to become light and to become that light to others. Last week, I told you that God had no 
reason to do what he did for us. If God said, hey, I gave you everything, you messed it up, I'm sorry, well, I'll try again in a couple thousand years, no one would have faulted God. But God chose to give us that perfect gift, the light of the world, and to say, you know what, I don't care about the fact that you've completely messed this up over and over and over again. I'm going to teach you that I'm the light of the world, and I want you to be that light now. And we learn from the example of the disciples that there are going to be times where I fail at being light. There are going to be times where I fail at abiding with Christ, at remaining with him, at sticking close to him. But I must have endurance to get up and try again. The answer for us in this year, again, especially more than any year, if we wanted to focus, the answer for us to respond to God's love and God's perfect gift of bringing down the true light is that we abide in the light and then we bring that light to others. Let's stand up for a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Lord, we thank you so much for the precious gift that you have given to us in your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Um, truly the perfect gift that we are completely unworthy to receive. Even more than that, Lord, we are thankful that you have called us to, to partake in, in being light with you. We thank, we're so thankful, Lord, that all you want for us is to abide in you, to remain in you, to have a relationship with you, and then bring that relationship to other people. Lord, continue to work in our lives. Continue, oh Lord, to, to strengthen us and give us that endurance to remain in you and to abide in you, to truly want to spend time with you and to grow with you in this upcoming year. Um, and Lord, as we prepare to receive uh, your only begotten son on, on the Feast of Nativity in just a few days, that not only are we just so thankful and honored for the precious gift that you have given to us, but that we respond accordingly, Lord. We respond full of love, full of joy, that we want to just spend time with, we, with you. We want to grow with you, and we want to be light to others around us, Lord. We ask you, Lord, that by the grace of your Holy Spirit, that you help us to do these things, that we know, Lord, that we're not worthy, um, that, that we are, um, we're always going to fall short, Lord, but that you continue to work in us and you train with us, um, and you train us, Lord, not one time, two times, but three times, but you continue to chase after us, Lord, um, like you chased after Zacchaeus today. We pray, Lord, all these things in your name, through the intercessions of your Holy Mother of God, the Theotokos Saint Mary, and all the choir of her saints, here says, we pray thankfully, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thanks for joining us here today. You can find us on any social media platform, and feel free to share a message that inspires you with family and friends. If there's anything we can do for you, visit our website and let us know how we can help or how we can pray for you. If you aren't receiving our weekly email, please click the Stay Connected button on our website. Have a great day.